Yes. Okay, well, let me let me formally welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this um, special grand rounds because of World AIDS Day week. Um, World AIDS Day, as everyone knows, was yesterday. And we have a somewhat a little bit different rounds from what we normally do in honor of World AIDS Day. And we thought this would be very interesting for our audience. Um, before I introduce today's speaker, let me remind you of our upcoming rounds. Uh, the next one, and it'll be the last one for this calendar year in December, will be on two people on December 16th. And these are former fellows of ours. Um, Rita Melendez talking about using research recruitment strategies as a guide for expanding services to Latino immigrants, lessons from 20 years of HIV research. And we have been um, alongside Rita that same day will be David Knapp Whittier. The title of his talk is More Than the Pill, Articulation and Implementation of HIV PrEP as a System in US Public Health. And then I'll give you a heads up for the first one in the new year, January 6th. Again, two people, we have Raymond Moody, the role of emotion regulation in maintaining syndemic burden among sexual minority men. And then we have Michael Vaughn, three, three gay generations, the ongoing impact of HIV AIDS on meaning making processes. So um, please uh, join us for, for those rounds. So today, like I said, we have a very special, interesting, and a little bit different from our, our normal research, um, empirical research presentation. Um, <laughs> we're, we're privileged to have Abram Finkelstein, who is an artist, a writer, and an activist. He's a founding member of the Silence Equals Death and Grand Fury Collectives. His work has shown at MoMA, the Whitney Museum, the Q Cooper Hewitt Museum and the Metropolitan Museum and is in the permanent collection of MoMA, the Whitney, the New Museum and the Metropolitan Museum, the Victoria and Albert Museum and the Brooklyn Museum. That's quite impressive. <laughs> He's featured in the Artist Oral History Project at the Smithsonian's Archives of American Art and his book for UC Press, After Silence, A History of AIDS Thought, Its Images, was nominated for International Center of Photography 2018 Infinity Award in Critical Writing and Research. He's been widely interviewed, New York Times, Freeze, Art Forum, NPR Slate interview, and has spoken about art, AIDS activism, LGBT cultural production, and the American left at Harvard, Yale, Columbia, Princeton, and NYU. So again, this should be very interesting. We're very pleased to have you, Abram, and I'm gonna turn the uh, floor over to you. Welcome. Thanks very much, and thank you all for inviting me today. Um, I'm gonna... Actually, my uh, point of view about my own work as um, an artist who's done public projects surrounding HIV AIDS is so aligned to the work I think that you do. And I also come from a family of doctors and scientists. I'm the black sheep of the family, the only artist. So I, I entered AIDS activism with a deep understanding of, of how research is done and funded and what the meaning uh, of it is. And I'm gonna be talking today, let me screen share. I have images so that, let's see. I have to get rid of that. Uh, sorry, this is always an adventure, the screen share. So I have images that will help um, illustrate what I'm trying to say today um, as a way to situate a conversation about World AIDS Day week. Um, I want to focus on a constellation of interrelated AIDS ad, uh, activist advocacy campaigns that took place at the same moment in time, um, and each of which is um, represented by a grand fury work that I had a hand in creating. So I, I Basically, what I want to do is give a larger context for this work as a way to maybe help you think about the ways in which um, audiences or communities respond to um, complex questions. Um, but first, I'd like to situate the, um, the ways that the strategic thinking behind these works might be relevant to our current cultural landscape and offer a somewhat more capacious overview of my uh, 
own social justice practice in the context of the primary dilemma of the 21st century, which I have come to think of as an image dilemma. Um, so what do I mean by that? Um, images have always existed as a way to communicate uh, complex ideas, but um, for more recent contexts, let me begin with a very brief overview of what I'll be referring to as our image commons. In other words, we're so flooded with images, we carry around archives in our, <laughs> in our pockets. Um, we're, it's so much, it's so integral to the way in which we think about ourselves that the uh, image commons is a way in which I refer to our shared spaces that are molded and defined through the use of images. Um, as a greater context for that set of conversations, many of our current theories about how images articulate cultural meaning took form during the modernist and surrealist movements of the early 20th century. But the television age is really responsible for our vernacular understanding of the proliferation of images as the cultural byproduct of mass media. Um, Having said that, the ways in which we think about our image culture and uh, image commons in critical terms was actually further refined around the advent of the age of television um, and solidified through feminist and postmodernist critiques that you don't have to know anything about, but, but that's what happened. And by the second half of the 20th century, this, there was the volley between high and low culture eventually delivered us to this current moment, which is, I would characterize as a post-fact fever dream <laughs> fueled by information technologies, which crystallized during the turn of the 21st century into the image dilemma that I, I'll be speaking about today. Um, this dilemma impacts the way we see everything. But today I'm gonna to be foc focusing on this impact about how we imagine the American AIDS historiography. So at the turn of the last century, the 20th century, well, mod modernism was changing the ways we considered our cultural spaces. The assassination of Archduke Ferdinand in 1914 uh, set the political events of the entire 20th century into motion. The 2016 American election was comparable to that event. We are living in a period which is currently triggering the events that will define the entire 20, 21st century, um, which is why I wanted to speak about this work in a larger context. Uh, our finally, our meaning America's finally having uh, joined the global march of proto-fascism, which has been going on internationally for a while, has already led to novel expressions of authoritarianism, uh, owing to the shift away from oligar oligarchies of oil to oligarchies of hackable information technologies, which are the spoils of the combined surveillance economies of America, Russia, and China, and which have been openly formalized uh, over the last several years in America. Um, the American culture for those who, of us who have an interest in current events are, is becoming aware of this, this transition. And it's such a radical transition that I think people barely under, understand it or understand how it functions. So in this new environment, data is king and inter internet content is the coin of the realm. The result is a death match between sovereignty and identity, the state and the individual. And it's delivered it to us as if it were a sports competition by an enfeebled punditocracy uh, in the obsolete language of the last century, neoliberalism. So these formative decades of the 21st century uh, in, in, during this period, our information archives have migrated to pocket computers um, and ephemera moves at the speed of light across a, a landscape of Mobius 
uh, non-orientability. Um, boosted by these digital accelerants, the smartphone, the pocket computer, centuries of suppositions based on enlightenment, on the enlightenment still linger. For some reason, they're, they seem to be uh, immune to, to uh, social media in some way. So these enlightenment notions still linger, even though social media neutralizes any of its vestigial prerequisites of the enlightenment, such as the very concept of proof. Truth and its evidence is increasingly contested, not in the field of sciences, but in the field of cultural production and the ways in which we understand our culture through images, which is why I refer to the earliest uh, set of social predicaments of the 21st century as an image dilemma. I don't know if you're all aware of deep fake technology, but um, this is an example of it. How, how can we de determine what is actual when bots are as convincing as the humans who develop them? And deep, deep fake technology can fabricate photo documentation in a machine learned zeptosecond. Um, I don't know if you listen to the Facebook um, hearings the, the most recent ones by the whistleblower of Facebook in Congress, but she, she pointed out that the algorithms are actually weeded through for content by, com by computers, by machine learning. So it's not even humans who decide what is negative content on Facebook, it's machines. It's algorithms that decide which algorithms are destructive. Um, so within this rapidly intensifying digital commons, how do we perf perform participation when we can't exactly know what we're participating in? Um, uh, how do we map the tensions between access and limitation, literacy and leg legibility, marking and erasure, identity and colonization, or agency and refusal. All of these things are component pieces to how we come to identify ourselves. Um, and when our image commons becomes increasingly destructive, as it does now, this is an image of an ACT UP demonstration, but it's 30 years old now. Um, when the image commons becomes destructive, as it is now, how do we mount an effective resistance to it. And finally, if we can't believe our eyes anymore, what possible use is, an Im is a culture based entirely on images? America's no longer a country in any traditional sense of the word. It's instead a digitized procession of content, symbols, archetypes, and codes. Uh, it's an aggregate articulation of the vacillation between America's promise and America's cruelty. Um, and this vacillation presents as a flexing of hegemonies, um, you know, power structures, but it's far too potent to be strictly described in, as the institutional side effects of America's false guarantee of abundance. Um, this current cu cultural turning point is not simply a digital translation of the power narratives that have defined Western hierarchies for centuries, redesigned for the ease of handheld uh, content delivery systems, the smartphones, um, which have helped to redefine our image commons, uh, totally changed our image commons. What maps the parameters of America's new social spaces is unfortunately far more prim primordial. To be sure, um, and goes, goes into cognitive sciences, um, um, uh, to be sure, Americans prom America's promise and cruelty have long been codified and institutionalized in a myriad of ways, um, but they are now signifiers of deeper predicaments, and that's what I'm hoping to explain to you. So for those of you who are my age, 
you might remember this ad. According to Coca-Cola, this is how we wanted to see ourselves in 1971. Young, of differing origins as seen through the scrim of white imagination, singing together on a hill, all with a Coke in our hands. This landmark television ad was so popular that the jingle um, was released as a pop song with the lyrics, I'd like to buy the world a Coke, from which were the lyrics in the commercial, changed to I'd like to buy the world a home. The pop song said I'd like to buy the world a home. By the turn of the 21st century, however, you could have your very own Coke. You could have a personalized Coke as a way to celebrate in your individual personhood, but not everyone can have a home, right? So what does this reversal, what does this psychological marketing reversal say about our image commons? I use Coke as an example here because the language of advertising is a a highly tuned language built around focus groups conducted with one simple objective. Culling the messages we already respond to, that's what a focus group does. It finds out what we already think so that um, we, can have, uh, we can have images or ideas fed back to us to sell us products, services, celebrities, candidates, or ideas. Um, so the image commons of late capitalism is a feedback loop, actually, if you think about it. Or more accurately, it's a force feedback loop when you consider that we are based on our search habits. We are uh, uh, instantly served ads based on algorithmic analyses of our search habits. Our cell phones are highly targeted focus groups studies. They're also micro-targeted surveillance devices. Um, we're being tracked. And so over time, advertising vernaculars, I believe have replaced other communal understandings of ourselves and our comments. So I, I, I'm positing today that advertising has become the folk language of capitalism. What do I mean by that? So a folk language is commonly agreed, is a commonly agreed upon vernacular that centers primarily on usage, on, on a communal sense of usage. And it's one that solidifies a form of storytelling literacy. In other words, it's handed down from generation to generation through which we engage in a shared experience of ourselves um, in the case of the 21st century within our heavily mediated social spaces. In the case of the 19th century, it would be small immigrant communities or urban centers, or you know, those were the, the ways in which we gauged our commonalities. But folk languages don't really reflect cultural truths, they reflect our beliefs about ourselves. And so the internet, if you think about it, is a densely layered folktale gone wild. It's a 21st century throwdown between the sponsored narratives in our shared spaces and the commons they theoretically depict. We're being told about ourselves, right? But no depiction, in this context is immune from the mission creep of late capitalism or its storytelling. And so the contours of the 21st century image commons are not at all what they appear to be. Instead, it's a landscape that torques our imaginings of where and how we appear in it as individuals. Here in the 21st century staging, I mean, it's been true for the late 20th century as well, but here in the 21st century in particular, staging any form of public discourse is to be trapped in a skirmish between topic and telling. In other words, the story and the object of the story. Um, the battle between who we are and who we are told we are. Um, and it's all happening along this increasingly permeable, permeable border between the commons and the images we use to represent it. There's a big difference between what we see at our, our window and what we see 
on a pocket computer or on a television screen. So we're inundated with images, but we're not given the literacy to, unless you're like myself, this is your area of concern. Um, we're not, by and large, as a culture, we're not given the literacy we need to discern the meanings of images. And so without realizing it, we atomize the comments every time we click on the phrase, I accept these terms and conditions without reading them, which we all do every day. You can't do an internet search without clicking that, that phrase. Um, and every time we do click that phrase on our pocket computers, we're triggering a steady, steady, uh, steady stream of egalitarian fantasias of connectivity, of agreement, of co commonality. Welcome to Facebook. Um, in this commons, access is participation. And in a way, it's the only agency we need to express in the 21st century. Um, but while these tropes shape our ideas about who we are, they're simultaneously dismantling it, as I've tried to previously explain. So it's counterintuitive, but popular culture uh, is much more than mere entertainment. Um, it is, in fact, a power narrative or a set of power narratives, the way centuries of Western European aesthetics were before it. It's a narrative of capital, of class, but we no longer need the Medicis to reinforce Western hegemonies. We simply have to swipe right. Even the seemingly spontaneous crowdsourced zeitgeist of social media is conjoined with this uh, perpetual motion feedback loop and serves to mirror the images and texts that are cycling through us. Um, but our performance of interactivity is not simply participation. It's tallied um, in terms of data as a pre-buy of goods and services and much in the same way that voting for your um, favorite singer on The Voice is an indication to the recording industry of potential album sales for the singer that you're voting for. And um, it, it's, it simultaneously is a surrendering of your data for follow-up marketing in that endeavor, should these artists become signed to a record deal. It's a service not to you. The participation feels like it's a service to you, but it's not for you, it's to potential investors. And it signifies financial viability in a project in much the same way that polling data on political candidates paints a picture of viability to our political donor classes. There's no corner of the digital commons that's immune to the deployment of images as a reification of institutional objectives. Images are everywhere, sit situating each of us within layers of marketing endeavors. We don't think of it this way, but this is what's happening. And people who communicate in public spaces like myself think about this stuff. But images are funny things. They're the driving force of an image culture. Um, we wake up to them and they tuck us in at night. I watch shows on my laptop computer in bed. I don't know about you. Um, and we're inundated with them way past the point of familiarity. They surround us, so we think we know everything there is to know about them. But there's, uh, they're simply the givens of our media landscape. They are the sky, rocks, and trees of our, of our media landscape. And most of us barely think twice about them as they pass in front of them, like the background in a cartoon. As a consequence, we believe we understand how images work because we're inundated with them, we're saturated with them, but we're not given the tools to consider them critically. Even the images that come to identify us very deeply. So this brings me to the images we're here to talk about today on World AIDS Day, the images associated with HIV AIDS which can be used to provide useful insights into this phenomenon that I'm speaking about 
uh, um, and seeking to explain to you uh, uh, its function here on World AIDS Day. The story of HIV AIDS has so long ago been re replaced by its storytelling. And like everything else in our image culture, internet mashups convert our AIDS past into memes and tropes. We inhabit a world of such accelerated content consumption that scholarly consideration uh, attempting to deep, deepen our understanding of AIDS simply can't outpace how we talk about it in our cultural wilds. So any meaning made of the silence equals death image within academia lies in the penumbra of the 95 foot video wall made of that phrase by U2's production designer for the band's 2015 world tour. This is the all a part of the dilemma I'm trying to, I'm attempting to describe. So for the purposes of this discussion, it might be useful to shift to the genesis of several examples of AIDS agitprop for deeper context. But before that, I wanna talk about the context in which those images were made. In 1981, HIV AIDS was a tempest on the horizon. Soon it was shaking the doors and in spite of its fiercely swirling vortex, the outlines of its cultural meaning were still discernible to be people who are trained to uh, make, to discern such things. Uh, and it began forming almost immediately into a narrative. Um, it's a narrative that's been supported for uh, a generation, generations now, uh, through films, documentaries, gallery exhibitions, theater revivals, and books devoted to the topic. And there's still many more undertakings in the pipeline, I promise you. I thought this was gonna be a passing moment. It's been going on for five years now and is no, in no danger of abating anytime soon. So here we are in a second vortex, a second spiraling storm, um, which I think of as AIDS 2.0. And it's in, as I said, in no danger of abating. I've recently been sent galleys for four books that take deeper dives into the narrative of HIV AIDS. And David Werner Gallery is in the middle of a series of international exhibitions on the subject. But um, this narrative is not actually the story of AIDS, it is its storytelling. And the key dilemma of this storytelling is not simply how it represents AIDS in the present. It's the fact of its having been built on a speciously laid foundation, the mediated storytelling that torques our understanding towards one tiny and true, but appealing corner that's shaped through pop popular discourse into a dominant narrative that suits political and economic power structures. This narrative is, which you're undoubtedly familiar with, is the heroic tale of an embattled community demanding drug research leading to pharmaceutical advances, offering viral suppression to patients um, with access. You're about to have a grand round on that subject I, I've just discovered today. Uh, it's a parable that proves that the system works, that protest works, um, in a, but it's in a way that's so pre, um, predicated on the presumptive neutrality of both whiteness and patentable pharmaceutical property rights. It turns its back to the rest of the, the parts of the pandemic that continue to, to rage, offering no resolution uh, no sense of resolution in its place. Resolution is fine for bedtime stories, but this synopsis has tipped everyone born after 1987, um, when the, the work that I had a hand in and will be discussing was designed, was made. Um, and everyone now working on HIV, AIDS is a younger activists um, are, in a historiological tailspin, uh, super, and it's superimposing ethical quandaries of extreme proportions in the process. For instance, how do you convince people to care about the millions of lives beyond the reach of treatment as 
as access or trapped by decades of HIV criminalization case law. Um, how do you create all over the world? How do, you, how do you create the will to fund research for a cure? Um, the only pharmaceutical intervention that might actually eradicate stigma. And if AIDS only matters where white people were threatened by it, and the only history that matters is how white people responded to it, what becomes of the majority of people still trapped in its furious spin? This is from the Art AIDS America, uh, protest of the Art AIDS America show uh, at Tacoma Art Museum. Um, so any serious scrutiny, even superficial scrutiny, reveals that the history of AIDS is not really a history at all. It would be more accurately described, in my opinion, as an intricate ecosystem of power narratives that have triggered this second crisis. And this second crisis is in fact a crisis of remembering. It's, it's, a, it's a parallel crisis to the, to the healthcare crisis. Unless you believe AIDS is a thing of the past, the dominant narrative of AIDS is not actually about HIV AIDS, it's about history and its uses. And unless you're equal parts, as I am, immunologist, activist, poet, and policy wong, what you believe you already know about HIV AIDS is actually largely a mashup of media images, vestigial enlightenment notions, pharmaceutical research data, and healthcare policy, real politic, um, the genesis of which was born of a unique constellation of social effects during a moment when it was compelling for a media core on the brink of deregulated consolidation in the 1980s and experiencing the infancy of the 24 seven cable news cycle. Remember all of this work that's being held up as an example of efficacious communication about AIDS was made in this context of a deregulated 24 seven cable news cycle that did not exist before that moment in time. Um, and that 24 seven news cycle uh, flooded the airwaves with stories to a panicked public having nightmares about airborne HIV transmission. And it was lucrative to do so. If you were not there to see this, um, how this, these existing snapshots of the pandemic played out in the late 20th century commons, where people thought you could actually catch, there was a whole summer where people were panicked that you could catch, catch HIV from a mosquito bite, right? Because it's a transference of blood or from a toilet seat like that old canard. And journalists had no trouble pitching stories to their uh, city desk editors or their producers. You would have no sense of any of this if you weren't there to witness that. You're just delivered um, the efficacy of this AIDS agitprop as a fait accompli. So I believe a deeper dive into one or two examples of these images that we closely associated with the successes of AIDS activism underlines what can happen when the ephemera that comes to represent our social histories are detached from the more complex storytelling or the more complex stories that actually drove them into being. Why do I, why am I telling you this? Well, I'll, I'll explain in depth in, in regards to this particular poster. In his 1995 essay for But Is It Art, uh, a book, the art historian uh, Richard Meyer drew an elegant line between the grand fury, the government has a, its blood on its hands on the left to John Hartfeld's 1928 poster, A Hand Has Five Fingers. His analysis situated this poster within the history of agitprop, favoring a historical reference to its aesthetic significance over an explanation of the political circumstances 
surrounding the making of this work. So I'd like to des describe that particular, polit those specific political questions that led to this poster's uh, production, but first let me tell you why. This image on the left, the government has blood on its hands, might be recognizable to some of you, um, but the two posters that it's based on are probably less so because they were made in support of a political skirmish that played out in Manhattan. And you may have never have heard about it unless you're familiar with this history. On July 19th, 1988, the New York Commissioner of Health, Stephen Joseph, suddenly slashed the number of estimated AIDS cases in New York City, a move that threatened to drastically reduce funding for AIDS services in Manhattan. This cut was purportedly based on cohort studies in San Francisco's gay community, but um, the data he drew on was also rumored to have been, uh, had a basis in a position paper from a right-wing think tank that posited that the Kinsey Institute estimates of the number of gay citizens uh, were called into question and that it wasn't 10% of the population as Kinsey posited, but really more like 3%. So I don't have, that's anecdotal. I don't have the position paper, but this was the conversation that was surrounding this reevaluation of AIDS numbers, regardless. Um, Act Up New York was not having it and declared war on Stephen Joseph. So during a sit-in at Joseph's office, a copy of his itinerary was stolen. It was sitting on his desk and somebody just picked it up and it became the basis for a campaign spearheaded by an Act Up affinity group. An affinity group is a group of like-minded activists who, are who agree on ob objectives and are willing and risk-taking that might be involved um, surrounding work, political work on that. This affinity group was named Surrender Dorothy after the sky-written threat by the witch in The Wizard of Oz, stop laughing. Um, irony was very much a part of the Act Up zeitgeist. So this itinerary was largely circulated throughout the entire um, Act Up membership. And we followed him day and night to public meet, meetings, to private meetings, to forums, to lunches, uh, to dinners. And it occasionally <laughs> even led us outside his private residence. The suit of Joseph, the pursuit of Stephen Joseph was so public and so relentless, it became somewhat high profile here in New York. And it even created skirmishes between local gossip columnists and news columnists over whether protester calls uh, to the commissioner's home uh, could be considered fair. Um, the commissioner was extremely unhappy about the act up scrutiny, to put it mildly. And it led to a late night visit to one particular activist's apartment by an NYPD police intelligence case squad that's generally tasked with police slayings after a har harassing call was made to Joseph's from this private residence, from this apartment. The Village Voice reported that Joseph was the source of this, was responsible for this investigation, this uh, police squad investigation, which led the lawyers within ACT UP New York who had movement experience to conduct a teaching on the history of covert H, uh, FBI surveillance, infiltration and disruption of domestic political organizations from 1956 to 1971 that was named COINTELPRO, the counterintelligence program. It was a program aimed at destabilizing the American Communist Party, the Black Panthers, the civil rights movement, and the <clears throat> anti-war movement. Deepening this already tense political climate with Stephen Joseph was the Tompkins Square Park riot, um, which began within days of the phone harassment of Stephen Joseph. Uh, 
Um, it was an incident referred to by the Times, if you didn't live in New York at the time um, or didn't pay attention to, to it. It was described by the Times as a police riot and a war zone. Um, and that was not an exaggeration. Um, the standoff lasted for days and it included mounted officers doing battle with bottle hurling, protesters and setting things on fire and low flying helicopters combing the rooftops with searchlights. Um, many ACT UP members lived near the park in the East Village and formed a very obvious presence in their ACT UP t-shirts during this police conflict that was staged around the homeless who were living in the park. It was an anti-gentrification demonstration that devolved into a days long riot. Uh, it, it, it began as an anti-gentrification uh, demonstration that was precipitated by Reaganomics. Um, and it was not only the Tompkins Square Park, but it was threatening all of Lower Manhattan as chronicled in the novel, Christodora. This is a photograph of the Christodora building, which was on, on the park and was the first condominium, uh, uh, co-op apartment in the area. And it was exorbitant, the prices were exorbitant and it became the object of incredible disdain. And there, there were riots that where people smashed the doors with police barricades from the, from the riot. Um, so this protest was staged as a spontaneous battle around the homeless in, Tompkins Square Park, but it's it spun out of control within hours and it lasted days and it impacted public sentiment, um, city policy and cultural production in New York for years to come. And it's, it, it can be seen as one of the bases for, um, in fact, for the uh, musical Rent, which is about a rent strike, but it it was founded in the Tompkins, the just, depictions were found in the Tompkins Square Park riots. So several members of uh, Grand Fury were involved in the effort to remove Stephen Joseph from office, myself included. Uh, so Grand Fury produced a series of bloody handprint uh, image posters to support this campaign to remove Stephen Joseph from office. We made two versions, the one on the left was directed at Stephen Joseph, the one on the right was directed at the then mayor, Ed Koch. And these posters were wheat pasted around New York City by members of Grand Fury and by the ACT UP membership. To support the postering, Grand Fury organized a small budget to bring buckets of red paint and rubber gloves to the floor of ACT UP to instigate a parallel graffiti campaign of bloody handprints that could go where the posters could not go and further reinforcing the images ubiquity before Madison Avenue had used this term viral marketing. This is viral marketing. This was, this was the use of viral marketing. Um, during that exact same period of time, that exact summer, um, ACT UP decided after uh, one of the international AIDS conferences uh, to target the regulatory agency responsible for testing a potential AIDS therapies in the US. I don't need to tell you the name, the Food and Drug Administration or the FDA. Um, given the high and rapid mortality rate, it became clear that any risks the medications carried could not be exceeded by the risks of non-intervention. And the clinical trials for safety and efficacy of these drugs had become de facto healthcare for individuals confronting what was then a fatal disease. So to quickly unpack this complex set of objectives and, and um, a series of realities, we needed something iconographic. The bloody hand seemed like the perfect candidate. So I proposed, the nationalization of this bloody hand image to Grand Fury. And we produce this larger vision of the poster, which is again, the one you're more, more likely familiar with. 
with the statistics, one AIDS death every half hour, which we later, need, later needed to change to every 15, um, every 15 minutes. We made sticker versions to replicate the gesture of the graffiti handprints um, to use in cities where, uh, or, you know, where there was no urban center and graffiti would not be effective. It was impactful. Um, and this image was used over the following years to help articulate the AIDS activist struggle. It was designed for the FDA action, but it, 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 it carried through for several years uh, as an image that was highly effective. So I would say that the FDA action was a turning point for ACT UP New York and for the AIDS activist movement, one that had an effect on the history of other social and, uh, movements and healthcare movements in America and, and potentially around the world. This action kickstarted the streamlining of the drug approval process and therapies that were languishing in the pipeline became more readily available. The parallel track drug access and compassionate use protocols we were fighting for were instituted. Um, more people living with HIV AIDS were included in advisory boards, as well as people of color and women, to name just a few of the accomplishments that came out of the FDA action. By and large, the political meaning of this work of Agitprop is, has been directly linked to all of that. But in hindsight, I've come to think of this, uh, this poster as having an alternative set of meanings, as the signal post of another main, main turning point in the AIDS activist movement. That is the transition away from critique to involvement within the research and drug, drug approval processes. The National Bloody Hand poster has come to represent an orchestrated campaign to expand access to life-saving AIDS medications, and it represents the efficacious deployment of, of collective direct action. Both of these things are true, of course, but like the change in Coca-Cola's marketing uh, that I was speaking about earlier, the fact that the national version of this image has eclipsed the two versions that this poster is based on tells us something else about uh, in historical and, and archival terms. The image had its genesis in this local skirmish that's been jettisoned from the story because it makes no greater point, right? But in my estimation, however, it was politically significant. Um, even though you may ne never have heard about it, the pursuit of Stephen Joseph was no less pitched or potent or intense than having taken on the FDA. Um, I believe that this small sit-in at a local health department, um, the local Department of Health office, was extremely instrumental, in fact, in ACT UP's finding its voice. And it set the stage for an ongoing relationship with the commissioner, Stephen Joseph, that spilled over into a local pilot needle exchange program, another essential story downplayed by dominant narratives. This image <clears throat> had its genesis in a local skirmish. Um, uh, and again, it was, I believe that this small sit-in at the local Department of Health was an essential part of the way in which we think about HIV AIDS. Within this unwieldy story is the tale of a community compelled by despair and, and urgency, the urgency of the moment, covered in red paint and doggedly willing to risk arrest over and over and over again, simply because it had to. ACT UP was not what we think of it now at this point in time. It was in its genesis. The Klieg light of the national media was not trained on this story of the, uh, the war with Stephen Joseph, but ACT UP would not back down. <clears throat> 
And as a result, this tiny affinity group um, powered by the tight solidarity of an only slightly larger collective in, of enraged individuals um, took risks that act up at its height was a couple of hundred people, the, the core membership that was involved in all of the strategic thinking and the actions was only a couple of hundred people. Um, as a result, this, so this, um, this tiny affinity group with the backing of a, the slightly larger collective of enraged individuals took risks and created tensions between Act Up New York and the police that led to ongoing surveillance of the organization and the political levy, the levy that accompanies that. During this period, the FBI did in fact keep files on ACT UP. It would be difficult to prove if or how Stephen Joseph's, the Stephen Joseph protests contributed to it, but this particular file that I'm showing you um, explains the chain of command to Canadian counterparts of an act of terrorism by ACT UP occurred at the Fifth International Conference on AIDS in Montreal, where Stephen Joseph was scheduled to speak. Um, I'm going to read you a text. It warns, quote, threats have been made against a member of guest speakers, unquote. And it goes on to say that members of ACT UP who were arrested by the New York Police Department would be there, it specifically says. And it advises, quote, that the counterpart should remain alert through asset and other coverage, it's in, the, in other words, surveillance and inf potentially infiltration, and gives this following instruction, quote, should an incident occur for which the FBI has investigative jurisdiction, that is violations of Title 18 United States Code Section 1203, which makes it a crime to take a US national hostage and or Title 18 US Code Section 2331, which makes it a crime to kill or assault a US national as a part of a terrorist incident. In the, that event, the FBI should be notified immediately. It would be years before the files uh, could be obtained through a Freedom of Information Act, but it didn't exactly matter once they were. The case squad visit that I talked about earlier had already riddled ACT UP New York with rumors about who might be informants amongst the memberships. Um, rumors that in fact linger to this day amongst uh, uh, the cohort of uh, ACT UP New York. Um, although the threat of surveillance didn't appear to overtly deter ACT UP's collective work, it, should be, it would be impossible to say how individual members were affected by, particularly activists of color who were already inherently at risk of policing, um, or how many people never made it past the announcement at the top of uh, every Monday night meeting calling for undercover police and FBI agents to identify themselves, which became the practice of ACT UP after the COINTELPRO teach-in. More to the point, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm, I'm talking too much apparently. More to the point, however, the radical reputation solidified by escalating episodes with various divisions of law and force uh, in New York and DC was certainly a factor in ACT UP New York's ability to exert, uh, exert influence over natural, national HIV AIDS research protocols. In fact, the Stephen Joseph saga may be one of the reasons you heard of the FDA action in the first place and the reason why it succeeded. And it certainly would, be, if that were true, would be why you heard of the bloody hand poster. I'm not juxtaposing, juxtaposing these three versions of the poster to downplay the importance of treatment activism's role in the drug approval process or, or uh, research being funded at Amer in America at the time. I'm doing it to help remind us of something that's easy to forget. Um, all we have now is the poster and the story. It's, uh, it was grassroots organizing that made these things possible, not the poster. The poster is 
the sock puppet that we, we drag out to represent this story and hundreds of other stories that um, have yet to be told. Um, so regardless of how effective this poster was as an organizing tool, it was actually grassroots organizing that created this change, not the other way around. Um, uh, and I do it to point out that there's a high wire running between critique and participation within power structures. And it's something that exists everywhere power is institutionalized, regardless of what the issue is. And, and in particular, it's true in the art world, Grand Fury's domain, and in the funding of scientific research, treatment activism. Um, the idea of the seat at the table that was kickstarted by the FDA action is also a contributing factor to this narrative foreground, foregrounded at the beginning of my talk, this heroic tale of direct involvement um, by AIDS activists and drug research and approval and the countless lives that were impacted or saved as a result. But this narrative, while true, is also problematic in one other way. So I wanna talk about another poster. This particular tale, this heroic tale that How to Survive a Plague um, describes in depth, the movie and, and the, uh, the book. Um, this particular tale has come to eclipse the many stories falling outside of the penumbra of that one story. The stories of decades of HIV criminalization case law, the needle exchange pilot programs, the lack of treatment access in communities of color, the setting up of housing works like um, the viral divide and ongoing HIV stigmatization, just to name a few. It's also a narrative that rarely acknowledges this one simple fact that is shocking if you actually think about it in, in the timeline. For the first 12 years of the pandemic, clinical data on women was considered irrelevant in America. As it happens, a few months be before the Joseph saga or the uh, FDA action began, the ACT UP New York Women's Caucus was in the process un of unveiling an alarming set of realities about the impact of HIV on women. So at the time of ACT UP's formation in 1987, AIDS was already the number one cause of death for women in, in New York between the ages of 24 and 29. Um, yet the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, would not include the manifestations of immunosuppression common to women in their definition for AIDS for another six years, 12 years into the pandemic, even though the clinical drug trials, public health standards of care, uh, American AIDS policy, was based on these guidelines and the WHO drew the um, CDC epidemiology for its own definition of AIDS. When the ACT UP Women's Caucus reviewed the specifics of the clinical data of women in HIV, they quickly uncovered this lethal chain of effects that no one seemed to notice before, or if it was noticed, it was not made public. Um, I'm certain it was noticed, it was just not, not made public. Um, not only were women excluded from clinical drug trials, which is a whole separate issue and is potentially ongoing, but the exclusion of women in the CDC definition meant that their doctors and caseworkers never even considered it a possibility that they might have been exposed to HIV. And the physiological markers of immunosuppression that clinicians normally tracked. At the time we were using T cells, right? Um, there was testing, but we were tra tracking it through clinical um, data. The, um, that data was being ignored in women. Those tests were frequently not even being taken. Um, as a result, women were not simply 
dying of AIDS, they were doing it undiagnosed and six times faster than men without access to appropriate treatments or benefits. Um, and long before they could develop the opportunistic in infections that fell within the case definition the CDC had constructed through cohort studies of gay and bisexual men. The Women's uh, Committee immediately organized a 1989 teach-in, the same year as um, the FDA action um, and the Stephen Joseph uh, campaign. And uh, they, this teaching was based on a comprehensive ACT UP Women's Caucus, Women in AIDS Handbook, which is, this is the book version. It was later published as a book, which they then circulated in an edition of 1500 to a network of activists, health professionals, clinicians, journalists, policymakers, and organizers doing work around women, not, not just in America, but internationally. Um, the handbook served as a basis for an even more detailed research and treatment agenda um, with, uh, for women with HIV infection. And it was the backgrounder for the first major action against the CDC that included critiques and analysis of CDC epidem epidemiology and policy. In other words, what we were bringing to the FDA, we were also at the exact same moment bringing to the CDC with regard to the definition of AIDS. Um, this, these uh, research, research agenda was also circulated among AIDS activists, service organization across the country and to the media as well, spearheading um, a massive a coalition organizing effort to force the CDC to expand the definition of AIDS to include women and intravenous drug users, a campaign that lasted four years. The first national demonstration uh, at the CDC gave ACT UP lawyer Terry McGovern the idea to file a class action lawsuit against the Social Security Administration on behalf of women with HIV who were denied claims because they didn't meet the speciously constructed or myopically constructed definition. The AMA signed on to the suit creating tremendous pressure on the CDC. In the middle of this campaign, this four year campaign to change the definition, Grand Fury was presented with the opportunity to create a project for the Museum of Contemporary Art in LA and the Public Art Fund in New York. And we decided to add pressure to the CDC with bus shelter ads in two communities that were directly impacted, Greater LA um, outside of the center of the city and the outer boroughs of Manhattan where women of color might be might have more access to the set of questions that we were raising. The tagline for the bus shelter, um, women don't get AIDS, they just die from it, which is, I think, one of the works I'm most proud of, um, became the primary text for organizing materials in the women's committee calls excuse me, call to expand the definition. And it uh, even led eventually to a full page ad in the New York Times that included uh, this tagline and 300 signatories. The CDC campaign was a dogged, ethical, intelligent, integrated, resourceful, relentless, and comprehensive internationally coordinated plan of attack. Um, amongst, amongst uh, activists and healthcare workers doing work around women, uh, during which the CDC attempted four inadequate changes to the definition, all of which were strenuously rejected and resisted. In 1993, they finally proposed a change that was acceptable to the Women's Caucus and all of the activists they were working in coalition with. So although the CDC campaign and the FDA action 
and the resulting treatment access happened simultaneously, the general omission of the CDC story reveals a giant gap in our dominant narrative. So this is why I'm why I'm bringing all these stories together to talk about the way the ways in which we conceive of the history of AIDS activism as being incredibly skewed, not inaccurate, just myopic or skewed. Um, and the fact that these two things were happening at the same time, but you hear about one and barely hear about the other, uh, reveals a giant gap in this dominant narrative, um, which prefers to long jump right over the question of women with HIV AIDS to the protease inhibitors that have come to symbolize the main successes of AIDS activism, uh, a success directly relinked to the FDA action plotline. As a consequence, the profound influence of women uh, in critical aspects of AIDS act, the AIDS activist um, movement has become a sidebar, even though AIDS activism is so, um, is so deeply based in the women's health movement of the 1970s. Um, so as is generally the case in an image culture, the broad strokes foregrounded by these two grand fury images overlook many of the facets uh, of the organizing that they actually articulate. Um, facets that might be more politically useful in my opinion. Um, I believe their deployment as examples of efficacious use of language and text and the continuum of political agitprop is monodimensional without a full accounting of the political context that drove these works into being and it's de a defanging of their original intention, which was as objects of resistance, not as objects of participation necessarily. I also believe that many such critical sagas remain hidden beneath the images we use to represent the dominant narrative. And constructing an ethical AIDS historiography means by necessity, it begins by necessity with an archeological dig as is exemplified by excavating the backstory behind these two works. Um, the narrative that political protest works in a democracy might be soothing, but it ignores that what protesters were demanding in this case aligned very neatly with the rising emphasis of deregulation in corporatist America. The drug companies were not unhappy with our demand for relaxed strictures in the FDA uh, pipeline. So I think it's important to have all of this in the context of the ways in which we think about the successes of AIDS activism. And uh, these are useful ways to think about uh, engagement going forward. The eclipsing of the story of uh, um, women and AIDS is just one particular narrative that reinforces centuries of disregard uh, within scientific research for the physiological distinctions that are gendered, but also the fact that AIDS activism owes a tremendous amount to the women's health, uh, feminist health movement of the 70s. So in summation, we've used images to convey complex ideas since the beginning of human history, but since the printing press entered common usage the and the subsequent rise of literacy rates led to an increased popularity of newspapers, which were eventually eclipsed by popular media following advances in photography and motion pictures. And then electronic technologies turbocharged everything. Television age changed every aspect of post-World War II culture and accompanied the rise of the middle class in America, recasting our ideas of what a commons might even look like. Um, al although they were both analyzing the rapidly changing nature of our culture as a result of television age, Marshall McLuhan and Guy Debord wrote, um, were two people writing about the media, the rise in media culture 
at the same time, Marshall McLuhan and Guy Debord, they had very different takes on this swiftly evolving uh, media culture. Uh, I would say that De Boer critiqued it and McLuhan embraced it. Two years after these two works were written in 1967, the Department of Defense began awarding contracts for the development of the internet. I am certain that the dominance of the Kardashians was the furthest thing from their minds when they did it. Uh, but it delivered social media to our doorstep through information technologies, which in turn sparked our current American political landscape into a, a flash fire. It's impossible to imagine to currently imagine the world without pocket computers or cultural storytelling without the images that propel it. But it's important to recognize that the smartphone is simply a delivery system. Uh, for content, the way the broadsheet was in the 19th century. The coolness of digital innovation is undeniably seductive, but it's not what we're actually looking at as we're riveted to the screens in front of us. Um, whether it's potent or powerful, meaning or frivolous, <clears throat> it's the content that's drawing us in. It's content that keeps us scrolling. Content is what helps organize political movements. It's also what creates engagement, political engagement and creates change. So I hope we have time for questions. Yes, we do. Uh yeah, Stephen yeah. will moderate that. Thank you. That was really fascinating. Thank you, Abraham. You're very welcome. Thanks, Bob. Um, so a reminder to everyone, if you have a question, you can enter it in the chat or use the raise hand feature and I'll unmute you. Tao, you can go ahead. Abraham, this was um, amazing. Um, it's nice to have a presentation with pictures. Uh, that's not what we use. Well, of course, people include pictures, but it's usually to illustrate. And the, the picture was the main, the main message. Um, a fascinating story, and uh, I think a lot of your sentences are almost quotes in and of itself that are very powerful. I I try to, um, in a way, you're arguing for comprehensive narratives and not for one-sided or please understand that the dominant narrative has a lot of other narratives that are uh, <clears throat> no longer visible. And I was thinking how to weaponize yourself to um, image-based storytelling that subverts reality. I tried to ask my question in your, in your <laughs> discourse. That's a really good question. Um, and that is the question. Um, mm -hmm. I think the, the, question of an image culture is, uh, it is, it is one of anything to do with um, late, late capitalism. You, uh, it's a never ending uh, discourse. You don't drop in, say one thing, disappear, and then the world changes. Changes, progressive, ongoing, things that are given can be taken away, we're watching. I don't know if you've all listened to the Supreme Court hearings yesterday. I did. We're watching um, such a thing happen. And so I think engagement is essential and it's really important to constantly be monitoring the ways in which we are told about ourselves. Again, <clears throat> mass media, mm -hmm. the image commons, the media landscape are not ideas of our own devising. We're, mm. we, this is what we're being told about ourselves and it differs wildly from how we see ourselves. The difference between polling on uh, um, reproductive rights and the right wing's idea of dismantling Roe v. Wade are miles apart. 
So you have to bear that in mind. So, um, and, and always be willing to, when they make a move to make a counter move, it's a chessboard. Mm. And the, uh, the other thing I would say about it is it, it can sound overwhelming and exhausting, but it's okay to put down the, the battle for a moment because someone else will pick it up, right? So I've been talking about these questions for decades now. Um, I'm 70, I won't be, you know, I, I have a, a couple of decades left to do it, but after a certain point, I will be gone. But I'm, I'm, that's why I think it's essential to explore these counter narratives, to expand our idea about what this, this history actually means so that after we're all gone, an activist in 2055 might actually change the world based on something that we have said in our analysis today and in, in our writing today. Does that answer your question? Uh, definitely. Well, it's it's not the final answer, but it's, it's, the, beginning right, it's, of, the, it's the beginning of an answer. But it also expresses your your trust um, or maybe your trust or your hope that uh, and in a way your acceptance of how things are but also your hope and your trust that things can evolve and it can evolve in a better direction than we're going now without doubt and i think the you know one of the most recent uh, discoveries with regard to the uh, the current pandemic is the similarities and differences um, that exist between them, but the um, the the agencies that existed are the same. The heads of these some of these agencies <laughs> are still the same, um, and uh, the, but what differs is the rapidity and the broad scale of it. So in a way, the COVID pandemic is a metaphor for what I've just tried to say to you, right? In the same way that accelerated communications has changed the way in which we might reach a public now or think about a public or, or what constitutes a public, um, everything else is accelerated as well. So it, I, I not only feel confident, I feel, um, and, and hopeful, I am dependent on my younger cohort. It's why I teach, it's why I, um, I uh, mentor young artists and activists, because I'm learning from them. They're teaching me things. And anyone who teaches knows that this, the secret of it, the hidden secret is that teaching is actually learning. And we get more out of it than our students do. Any other questions for Abram? Uh, there's a comment from Susan Trosh. Susan says, thank you so much for this catalyzing talk as usual. You're quite welcome. <laughs> it is my pleasure. And thank you for inviting me to spend some time with you. If there are, if there are no other questions, Stephen, I have another, another one. Abram, you started with saying, and I don't remember your exact word, but you say that what's happening right now of the 2016 election is a defining moment for this century. Can you elab elaborate a little bit on that? And it's, you know, it's not focused on HIV, but it's focused on images and narratives and... Well, and, and health, you know, dealing with pandemics, healthcare, as, yeah. as we're witnessing. Um, the, what's significant about what happened in America in 2016 was we, we, America has always been landlocked and somewhat segregated and inward looking, um, uh, even when it does participate in, in international events, it believes so much in its own exceptionalism that it, it's, uh, it believes itself to be immune from things that happen elsewhere. What we proved in 2016 was that we're capable of a slide into authoritarianism. We're in fact, struggling with it right now. And why that's significant is we have joined the international march of authoritarian movements, right? America, this, this proof, the proof of concept 
of democracy is potentially crumbling or certainly under great threat. And that's why it's significant, not because America is more important than what happens elsewhere in the world, as we're discovering, you know, with regard to South Africa and the current, mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. current um, uh, version of COVID or the strain of COVID is so attached to uh, the prevalence, the high prevalence of HIV in South Africa and immunocompromised individuals and the way in which health with healthcare is administered. So, um, so much of what's happening globally, America is now forced into a direct confrontation with. And that's why I consider it to be of significance for the entire century. We're, we have finally joined the globe in a way. Mm. And I think if, you know, if we can conquer these struggles, there are lessons to be learned, but if nothing else, it, it will change the 21st century. If the 20th century started in Europe and ended up, you know, mm. somewhere in the middle of the, you know, after the World War II, uh, it's shifting to an emphasis to America, American culture, American arts, American technology, uh, advances in all, in many fields. I think in a way, the 21st century is shifting back to the globe. Mm. For better or for worse. Mm -mm. Thank you. I, I also do really believe that the, the whole idea of uh, America stopped producing things uh, it, it, during the energy crisis here, during the Enron scandals here. And basically Wall Street began uh, speculating on the potential for sale of electricity, not the actual generation of electricity, the potential for sale of it. The market became the concept of it, which is exactly what I mean to say about content and content production. Um, in the 21st century image commons, um, it is content that is for sale. And we are vying in a marketplace with other um, uh, uh, powers, China and Russia and Iran and North Korea, who are have a very firm foothold in these questions. So the, the shifting of power internationally is something that has yet to be determined. Now, again, the DOD discovered the internet, right? Or, or, or activated it, actualized it. It's of course based on Alan Turing's you know, computer sciences, which is, you know, he was English and PS gay, um, I, I feel the need to say. Um, so, so much of what we take for granted has, has very broad um, implications globally and, and the genesis of it is broad. And that's why I mentioned Guy Debord and the French critiques of, um, of late capitalism that actually drove the French student strikes of 1968. The situationists were um, intricately involved in the wildcat strikes that brought France to its knees. So I think it's, um, we in academia have the advantage of, uh, of spending our time thinking about and contemplating the parallels and in, in, um, intersections of these questions. And I, I think that the 21st century is the, the America's joining of the intersectional global world. It's the, I, I realize I'm arguing this from a pr pr uh, perspective of privilege as a white man, but I feel that the, what we're witnessing is the dying gasp of that hegemony. And it's a period of transition to what it actually means for America to be like the rest of the world 
in that whiteness and colonialism um, is not necessarily going to determine the next century. It determined the previous centuries, but the 19th century certain, certainly, but it's, it, I, I believe it will not be determining the 21st century. And yay, I'm really happy about that. That's the world I have dreamt of my entire life. So I'm one of those white dudes who, who's really okay with it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Abram. Um, we're coming up on 11, so Bob, I'll turn it back to you for closing remarks. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you, Abram. Thank you, Teo. And, and thank you, everyone, for being here. It really was you know, very stimulating. And, and I think we need to have more of this and continue these kinds of discussions. So, so thanks. Um, take care, everyone. Be well. And, um, and um, hope to see you on December 16th for our next December rounds. Thanks for inviting me. Be well. Bye-bye.